Ted Save. It's the uh, 20th reading of the year, and it means you shall command. As in Exodus chapter 27 and verse 20. You shall command the sons of Israel, and they shall bring you clear oil of beaten olives for the light, to make a lamp burn continually. This is a command for all Israel. There it is. You see there at the bottom, it shall be a statute forever to their generations on behalf of the children of Israel. What is? that all of Israel, all of Israel, all of Israel is to bring pure olive oil. Okay. Now that's very important. You know why it's very important? The menorah. The menorah is the only light in the holy place. The tabernacle is the only place that the Lord has given instruction for the people to set up in order for him to meet with them. The oil for this light comes from whom? The people. This was the priestly ministry of the people. Oil is a picture of the Ruach, yes, spirit. And so how do the people bring the spirit to the tabernacle? They bring the Ruach that is in them to the assembly where they meet God. Now, someone may object and say, well, those believers did not have the Holy Spirit. I object to that on the ground of what Paul said in Romans chapter 8 and verse 9. But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now, here's the key of what Paul said. But if anyone has not the Spirit of Messiah, he is none of his. So Paul gives us a basic principle that reaches back in time as well well as reaches forward in time. The scripture is progressive in its revelation. Don't ever forget that. The scriptures from Genesis to the Revelation, one, and it's progressive in its revelation. It is key to understanding any scripture in the broad context. Uh, There is this unity of Scripture in which all things are uh, tied together. I've said that to say this. This is a very important concept. Before instruction is given concerning the priesthood, the people are involved. They were involved with bringing free will gifts to the tabernacle so that the tabernacle could be built. And now they have an ongoing ministry in supplying the purest of oil for the golden menorah. All of us have the responsibility of bringing not only the pure oil, but also the half shekel that we read about last week. This half shekel was to be given to finance. Finance. Thank you. 
the daily worship service. Uh, every male that was numbered was to give. In addition, the people were to bring their own offerings to the tabernacle so that the worship and ministry of the tabernacle could go on every day. Behind all of the tabernacle and all of its functions were whom? The people. Why are these two verses set here before the description of the priestly clothing and not last week's Parsha reading where the golden menorah is introduced along with the other furniture of the tabernacle? It is because before the priesthood there are whom? The people. The application is quite evident. Each individual is a vital part of the whole body. And each one has the duty of bringing pure oil in order to keep the light burning at all times. Plus they have shekel, plus all of their offerings. And so each one of you is important to all that we do. Each one of you is a part of all that we do. Uh, without you, nothing would happen. Community is very important in God's eyes. God values community. Uh, there are many applications that spring out of this verse or this lesson that is given to us in uh, Exodus. We all give to support the overall ministry here. We all make it happen. It's not only given, but it's faithfulness in meeting together, getting to know each other, believing that the Lord has led you here for a purpose, and that purpose is to be involved in the ministry here. Everyone called here has been given and gifted with a gift to be used here within this body of believers representing Messiah himself. You know, our, our worshiping together and our eating together are all developing why we are meeting together. <laughs> and that is to become the body of Messiah right here. Ephesians has the expanded version. Remember, as I said, progressive revelation. We start with, in a sense, seed form. I call it root form. And we come right on up. And Ephesians gives us the big picture. Ephesians 1.4. Even as he elected us in him, in Messiah, before the foundation of the world, for us to be holy and without blemish before him in love. You see, it all began before the world came into being. Now, we have to begin there because that's really the beginning. Ephesians 2.10 says, For you are his workmanship, created in Messiah Yeshua unto good works with God before, and here it is talking about God beforehand prepared that we should walk 
in them. Ephesians 2.19, so then you are no longer strangers and tenants, but you're fellow citizens of the saints and of the, here it, here it moves into the family of God. You're, you're citizens of the saints and of the family of God. Ephesians 2.21, in whom all the building being fitted together grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together into a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. Now we're a temple, the meeting place of God. And Ephesians 4.4, 4, there is one body, one spirit, even as you also were called in one hope of your calling, one hope, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all. Whew. The one above all and through all, and what? In you all. But to each one of us was given grace according to the measure of the gift of Messiah. And indeed, Ephesians 4.11, he gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, uh, some pastors and teachers. And my mind goes back and Ed Source stays here with the passing of one of the great evangelists of all time, Billy Graham. I grew up there. <laughs> I grew up in his ministry. And what a powerful ministry that was. 20 million people throughout the world listened to a clear presentation of the gospel of the good news of Yeshua. I also grew up in an era of fabulous preachers, wonderful preachers. Dynamic preachers. I, I don't see either in our day and time. I'm sorry. But the passing of Billy Graham is the passing of a generation. And, it, and it's almost like Who's stepping forward? <laughs> Who's stepping forward? Now let me restart that verse over again. And indeed, he gave some to be apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers with the view of what does this say? For the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry. He's elected different ones of you with a view of perfecting the saints, as another translation says, for the building up of the body of Messiah until we all may come to the unity of the faith and the full knowledge of the Son of God to a full-grown man to the measure of the statue of the fullness of Messiah, but speaking the truth in love, we may grow up unto him in all things who is the head, the Messiah for whom all the body having been fitted, compacted together through every assisting bond, according to the effectual working of one measure in each part of you produces the growth of you? No, it's the growth of the body. To the building up of itself in love. Now that's the full-blown picture of what God intends. 
God values the community for what he desires to accomplish in the community. In Ephesians 5, then become imitators of God as beloved children, walk in love even as the Messiah also loved us and gave himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for an odor of a sweet smell. In Ephesians 6, take up the whole armor of God. Now, this again, this again is profoundly important. What Paul is describing we call the body of Messiah, or simply community. It takes commitment and it takes time to produce community. We don't want to produce simply a church. We want to produce a community of believers representing as the body of Messiah, representing the Messiah himself. And, and, and so it takes commitment. And it takes time. I say it takes commitment and time, but that doesn't happen until it's a priority. <laughs> And, and so I encourage us all to make community building a priority in your life. You're safe in a safe community. And we do everything that we possibly can to make this a safe community, a safe body of Messiah. And we mentioned last week that the commandments are relational and really must be fulfilled in community. We mentioned the Lord's Prayer. It's in the plural. We mentioned the prayers of Paul. They're in the plural. We're told to pray our Father, and we're, we're, this is why it's God values community. And so in Exodus here, the people have a fundamental role in what will happen to bring God to dwell among his people. The light of Messiah has several uh, I'm sorry. The light of the menorah <laughs> uh, has several applications and analogies. The common analogy is the picture of the Messiah who is the light of the world. Another analogy is a picture of each one of us as the light of the world. There's another one, and you know well what I'm referring to here. And, and that is the Torah itself. For Proverbs 6, 23 says, For the commandment is a lamp, and the law is a, what? Light. And reproofs of instruction are the way of life. How many of us think of reproofs as being cool? <laughs> as being a good thing. And, and yet God does. And I, I, I tell you, God will reprove you <laughs> through his word. And if you don't read it or do you respond to it, he'll reprove you. <laughs> without his word because he's concerned for you. We either learn the easy way or we learn the hard way. And you young people need to know that 
right up front in your life. <clears throat> Concerning the mitzvah, the mitzvah is a lamp and the Torah is a light, Proverbs says. Uh, Gil, yeah, he's a commentary, commentator who wrote a commentary. The law of God is a lamp or candle to see to what by and to walk women. Well, sometimes these guys that lived in another age speak better English than I do. The law of God is a lamp or a candle to see, to work by, and to walk by. It enlightens the eyes and directs the feet and makes working more pleasant and walking more comfortable. And indeed, without the light, a man knows not rightly what to do or to where he should walk or where he is walking. Psalm uh, 119, 105 says, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Well, Psalm 19, the Torah of Adonai is perfect, returning the soul, the testimony of Adonai, sure, making the simple wise. Well, the commandment is like a particular lamp, and the Torah is like light. It serves as a light. Light gives new understanding to everything, doesn't it? The light does not create the objects that it illuminates, but only illuminates those things that are previously hidden. You and I walk in the darkness of this world. And we are insufficient in and of ourselves to see what is hidden in the darkness. We all need help. We all need light. Nothing substitutes for the lamp of the commandments or the light of the Torah. For the word guides us in our actions. The word guides us in the right way, which is the wise way. The way of truth, purity, righteousness, and joyfulness. The word is also our defense. Uh, our defense from a lot of different forms or kinds of danger, but we are unconscious of the spiritual dangers that lie all around us. The Word of God is like a fence that provides security for us. There are so many out there that will undermine your faith. There are so many out there that will lead you astray. There is so much out there that will harm you, try and control you, and lead you off in some uncharted waters. You may or may not survive. For many have made shipwreck on the rocks of life. The dangers are great, especially for those who do not have the light of God's instruction. And yet it's also 
a companion. A companion. God's Word can be a real companion in your loneliness, in your own personal life. Now, Torah may satisfy someone's curiosity or develop someone's mental pride. But the primary purpose of this light is to guide our living. The purpose of revelation is practical and life-changing. As the psalmist says, the commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. Your lamp is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. You, you cannot approach the scriptures simply to accumulate intellectual knowledge, solve abstract problems, come up with authoritative dogmas, but we approach scripture to lead us in the way of life, in the way of peace. You want meaning in your life? The scriptures will lead you guide you in meaning for your life. Wonder what life is? Wonder where you are in life? The scriptures will tell you very plainly. One of the challenges that we face as we read and meditate and study scripture is a unique challenge. We have to understand that the study of scriptures adds as many mysteries as perhaps it explains, as we've talked about before. We have to live with some mysteries for, for explanation we relate to the eternal God where there is always some mystery that makes God, God. And we cannot be content with simply reading, hearing, understanding, and assenting to the commandments, but we have to obey them and to walk in their light. You will not go astray. Let me say you won't have to learn the hard way. Because the hard way can be hard. <laughs> the hard way can be really challenging. Now there's one last picture. I'm sorry. Uh, in Exodus chapter 30 and verse 7, And Aaron shall burn sweet incense on it every morning. When he dresses the lamps, he shall burn it. And when Aaron lights the lamps at evening, he shall burn it. A perpetual incense uh, before Adonai throughout your generations. As uh, the high priest, Aaron, was to do these two things daily. No, twice a day. He was to dress the menorah and he was to burn incense. In our lives, this would be reading scriptures and what? Incense, praying. Praying. It's like these two verses in the Revelation. And another angel came and stood at the altar having a golden censer and many incenses. My computer, uh, too modern, it didn't, rep it didn't see that as a word. I'm sorry. But it did put an ES on the end. And many incenses were given to him so that he would offer it with the prayers of the saints on the golden altar before the Lord. And the smoke of the incense, which came with the prayers of the saints, ascended up before God from the angel's hand. Isn't that beautiful? 
It's like David said, evening and morning and at noon, I will pray and cry aloud and he shall hear my voice. Here he prays three times a day. How many times a day do you pray? How many times a day do we read God's word and meditate upon the words of God? Once a day? I hope so. I hope so. Did you realize that many times in Scripture, Adonai or the angel of Adonai appeared to his people while they were praying? A few examples would be David, Solomon, Daniel, Zacharias. We never know what will happen when we pray. We may think nothing's happening. And yet, it may move the mountains out there. And, and that's what the Lord taught. If you had a little faith, uh, uh, just as small as a grain of mustard seed, you could say to that mountain, move. And it moved. I always wondered, I said, Lord, are you talking literally here or are you sort of giving us a... But it's a powerful teaching. Do we really believe prayer is as incense that rises up to God and he smells it, as it were, and it becomes a sweet smell? To our God. Yeah. Do we really believe it? Do we really believe in prayer? We need His light every single day. And we need His Spirit that can bring this stuff to our mind. at the right time, for the right purpose. God is good, and he has provided that which is good for you and for me. And let me ask you a question as we close this morning. Do we value what God values? 